Welcome to the virtual night at the aquarium. We're here at the St. Louis Aquarium at Union Station, and tonight's event is sponsored by the St. Louis Aquarium Foundation, the Water Institute at St. Louis University, and the Office of Alumni Engagement at St. Louis University. I'm Dr. Jason Kanoff, and I'm a professor in the Department of Biology at St. Louis University and a primary investigator in the Water Institute. The Water Institute is a newly established research center at St. Louis University focused on interdisciplinary investigation of some of the most important issues in water conservation and management, both in the region and beyond. Water resources are fundamentally important to society. They drive our economic growth, they contribute to human well-being, and they support the quality of our ecosystems. However, we're facing some of the greatest challenges that humans have ever seen. Ongoing changes in climate, human population growth, and changes in the way we manage our land are all impacting our water resources and having subsequent effects on society. However, with these great challenges come great opportunities. And the St. Louis Aquarium and the Water Institute at St. Louis University are well poised to contribute to these challenges in the St. Louis region and beyond. So for example, some of the research that's going on in the Water Institute right now focuses locally on the Merrimack watershed. It's a wonderful resource for the St. Louis region and provides water for up to 250,000 people. Some of the research that we're focused on in the Water Institute at St. Louis University focuses locally on the Merrimack River watershed. So we've spent a lot of time working with regional partners, trying to understand how human activities are influencing water resources and water quality in the region. So for example, we're thinking about ways where we can remediate problems with lead in the big river, the impacts that some of these uh, lead concentrations are having on freshwater biodiversity. We're also trying to understand how climate change is impacting river flows and water quality in the Merrimack. So for example, when as climate changes, we're expected to have more intense precipitation events in various times of the year. These intense precipitation events can then result in flooding and decreases in water quality due to runoff from the landscape. And so what we've been working on with the Nature Conservancy is trying to think of ways to improve the landscape, for example, by planting trees on riverbanks and using these newly planted trees to dampen the impacts of intense precipitation events, so decrease flooding events, and also increase water quality by decreasing the amount of sediment, nutrients, and contaminants that get into the watershed. And at the same time, we use this information to think about ways to conserve freshwater biodiversity. So for example, if we're interested in the smallmouth bass fishery in the Merrimack River watershed, we wanna ask the question, how can we improve riverine habitat over the next century to foster a positive growth in the fishery in the Merrimack River watershed? Some other projects we have focus on the impacts of agriculture in Illinois on water quality, and then the impacts that climate change may have on intensifying these effects. And so we're thinking about ways that we can reduce the amount of nutrients that actually get into our rivers and streams and then have subsequent effects downstream on freshwater ecosystems all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. And at a larger scale across North America, we have an extremely ambitious project where we're trying to quantify what changes in climate will do to our rivers and streams and ecosystems in every watershed across the US and Canada. So using climate data, what we ultimately wanna do is give aquatic ecologists, natural resource managers, and even city managers and state managers information on the types of water resources that they'll have available to them in the coming decades, and then possibly use that information to better prepare for the ongoing changes in temperature and precipitation that we expect to see over this time. So with that, I'm gonna end and segue over to a tour of the aquarium and I'll see you at the end of the evening for a Q&A session. Welcome to the St. Louis Aquarium at Union Station. My name's Amelia and today we're gonna to give you a sneak peek at what you will see when you visit the aquarium. When it opened its doors in 1894, this was the largest and busiest train station in the world. But now we have a new mission. 
to connect people with aquatic life and build a community that cares for and protects the environment. Let's go check out a few of the amazing animals that live here. Our first stop in the aquarium is our grand lobby. Look up, the ceiling in here is alive. Well, actually, it's just a giant TV screen where we can feature marine animals. Since all rivers and streams carry water to the ocean, protecting our ocean starts with protecting our local waterways. Here in St. Louis, Missouri, we're positioned at the intersection of the two largest rivers in the United States, the Missouri and the Mississippi River. These rivers are thriving with life. If you were able to see through the muddy waters, you would see lots of really cool animals like the ones featured here in our confluence habitat. One really cool animal we have here is the paddlefish. Fish have a unique mouth shape and you can recognize them by their long snout that looks kind of like a paddle. They have an interesting way of eating. They swim around with their mouths wide open, taking in water and straining out the tiny plankton that they depend on for food. This way of finding food is called filter feeding. All the animals in this habitat live in fresh water, like the water found in our lakes, rivers, and streams, which doesn't have salt in it like ocean water. These fish are all local to the Midwest and the St. Louis, Missouri area. We also have some really cool freshwater species from other parts of the world, like our arowana fish. This is a fish that's native to Asia, and they're known for their ability to jump out of the water to catch their prey. When we talk about our favorite freshwater animals, of course we have to mention our North American river otters. This species is found throughout North America in Canada and the United States, and they can be found living near streams, lakes, or rivers. Our three otters are Thatcher, Sawyer, and Finn, and they are brother and sisters who are just under two years old. River otters are adorable animals with some pretty amazing swimming skills. As mammals, they need to breathe oxygen from the air, but they can hold their breath for as long as eight minutes underwater. Their fur is very thick and somewhat waterproof to help them keep warm and dry as they hop in and hop out of the water. They are great swimmers and they wriggle their long tails to propel them quickly through the water. You can always find these guys having a good time, either playing in the water, wrestling each other, or running around and chasing each other on this upstairs part of their habitat. We also have ambassador animals that our team does educational presentations with. It looks like our sloth coconut is out right now. One of my favorite parts here at the St. Louis Aquarium are our touch pools. Here you can find out firsthand what it feels like to touch a sea star, a sea urchin, or even a stingray. Next, I wanna show you our largest habitat at the aquarium, Shark Canyon. This habitat is 250,000 gallons of salt water. This is home to over 50 different species, including the squirrelfish, pilchards, pufferfish, stingrays, and of course, sharks. We have six different species of sharks, the largest being our nurse sharks, which can get up to 14 feet long in the wild. These sharks are one of a few species of sharks that don't have to swim to be able to breathe and use their gills underwater. They are often found resting on the ocean floor. We also have zebra sharks, which have a beautiful spotted pattern. You might be thinking that a zebra shark is an odd name for a spotted animal, but they're actually born with stripes and the stripes fade into spots as they grow up. Also in this habitat, you'll find two of our newest residents, our green sea turtles. Green sea turtles are an endangered species, meaning there are not many of them living in the wild, and they need our help to protect their species so they can survive. Both of our green sea turtles are rescues, which means they were found injured living in the wild. They were given medical care to help them heal, but still wouldn't be able to live in the wild on their own. We're thrilled to provide these beautiful turtles with a forever home where they can be comfortable, cared for, and inspire people to do their part to help protect this spectacular species. This is my favorite view in the aquarium. Here you can see how gracefully all the animals swim and move around each other. 
you'll notice it is a little bit dark down here. And that's because we try to recreate the habitat that these animals live in, in the wild. And the deeper you go beneath the water, the darker it gets because less sunlight is able to get through. So that's why we keep the lights down in our aquarium to recreate that natural habitat. Another really cool animal we have here at the aquarium are our leafy sea dragons. Related to the seahorse, these animals can only be found off the coast of Australia. If you haven't spotted them yet, it's because sea dragons are masters of disguise. And they really do a great job blending in with their habitat. Thank you for virtually visiting the St. Louis Aquarium at Union Station. We hope you can visit us in person sometime soon. Bye. Welcome to Hi, the St. Louis Aquarium at Union Station. My name's tour. Amelia, and today now we're going to give you a sneak peek at what you will see when you visit the aquarium. Stage. When it opened its doors in 1894, this was the largest and busiest train Brittany station in the here, world. But now we have a new mission to connect people with aquatic life and build a community that cares for and protects the environment. Let's go check out a few of the amazing animals that live here. Our Hi first guys. stop so in the welcome aquarium to St. Louis is our aquarium grand for you guys. Welcome Look to up. St. Louis the Aquarium to here all of our St. Louis University. Well, actually, it's just a um, giant TV well. screen. Just kind of fill you in. We're kind of doing a little animals. live filming for the St. Louis University homecoming. So we got lots of guests joining with us um, at home, with as well as all of you guys. So uh, we're going to kind of share the stage today. So this little girl is Coconut. She is our one and a half year old Linnea Two Toads Block. She's These gonna be hanging out with us tonight. I'm um, gonna be answering lots of questions that you guys might waters, have about her. Also gonna really be doing cool some fun like training on our tree our back here. So you'll get to see some of the behaviors one that really Coconut cool is working on. Is now, Coconut fish. is a young sloth. Cattle like I said, she is about one and a half. And you so can recognize that's not quite a baby. These guys do become independent when their mom's fairly young. They and that's because it takes a lot of energy for open, mom to have a little one hanging on to you all the time, as some of our parents might know um, how that feels like. So mom sloth is ready to kind of go about her independent way pretty um, as early as she can kind of convince baby to go on her way as well. So Coconut was actually born at another zoological facility. So she got to come live with us when she was 10 months old. Um, and that's because, like I said, her mom um, and her we're ready to part ways. Neither of them had to worry about predators being in that um, zoological facility. So Coconut didn't really need anything from her mom in terms of survival and she was ready to kind of start her own independent life here at the St. Louis Aquarium. So we're super excited for her to be part of our ambassador family and to be able to share her with you guys. So we'll do, um, so like I said, some kind of fun behaviors on the tree. Um, so she is, like I said, a young sloth, so she is still doing lots of learning. And a lot of that is just kind of learning what we we're trying to communicate to her and also to try to um, encourage her to become more confident and more independent in herself, kind of moving around different places and all that kind of stuff. And she's doing a great job. So you'll see I'll ask her to kind of move her to different parts of the tree, also practice some of her sloth muscles here. Good job. So lots of fun stuff. Now sloths are from the Central and South American rainforest. So they are from that rainforest jungle. And you can see they're pretty well adapted for their life in a tree. So she has these incredibly long sharp claws that allow her to hang herself upside down in her tree. So she just hooks those long curved claws right up there on that tree branch and drops her weight down. Now the reason why she does that is because it actually takes a lot less muscle to hang yourself upside down if you have those nice little coat hanger claws that she has than it would be to actually um, walk upright on those branches. So she's able to conserve a lot of energy by moving around in that way. That's really important for a sloth because their main diet are things like twigs, leaves, and bark. So she doesn't really get a lot of energy from those foods. So she wants to try to conserve as much energy as she possibly can. That's pretty much a sloth's entire mode of life is how can I save my energy because I don't really have a whole lot to start with. So um, by moving upside down, it's actually a lot easier for them than if they were to walk upright on those branches. Now they will do just about everything upside down in a tree. So they're going to eat, sleep, 
make baby sloths, even give birth to baby sloths upside down in a tree. The only thing that keeps that baby from plummeting down to the forest floor is actually the umbilical cord. So they kind of start out this world bungee jumping. It was pretty terrifying to me, but they have made it work for them. Good job. So uh, like I said, they'll do pretty much everything upside down in that tree. Now, the only thing that they're going to do right side up is they are going to go to another tree across the ground. So they can't walk on their feet, though. They can't support their body weight. So what they have to do is kind of lay on the ground and kind of army crawl forward in order to get to that next tree. So these guys are pretty dependent on uh, the tree itself. This kind of way that they move around is really only sustainable when they're actually up in their treetops. Now, like I said, they eat a diet that is completely herbivorous. So they eat nothing but leaves and fruits um, and vegetables and flowers, twigs, bark, things like that. So they're not going to be eating any meat in their natural environment. And a lot of what they're going to find on a daily basis anyway, good, is actually going to be that bark, leaves, and twigs. So not very energy or calorie filled foods. Good. So this behavior that I'm working on right now that you'll kind of see us do intermittently is called a targeting behavior. So basically I am asking her to target part of her body. So in this instance, her nose, good, to a target object. So this little red square. This is a really important behavior because it starts to open the communication of moving her around to different places, but it can also transition into a really important medical behavior like voluntary blood draws. So we can actually ask her to hold at that red target and she knows that if she does that she's going to get rewarded with that tasty treat or something that she finds really re rewarding which in this case is pretty much any of her food she's pretty food motivated and um, we can kind of pair that until she knows that she's going to get those tasty treats for hanging out at that red target and then be able to kind of approximate up to actually being able to get a blood sample from her all while she's just kind of hanging out with us otherwise it would be pretty stressful if all of a sudden we just tried to hold her leg and draw some blood from her. She might get a little scared or a little stressed. So it's actually a lot easier for us to be able to take really great care of her by using that training um, technique. Now all the training that you see that I am doing here with coconut as well as any of our animals here at the aquarium is what we call positive reinforcement operant conditioning. So what that means is we uh, pair that behavior that we like to see more of with something that they find positive or rewarding. So like I said, those tasty leafy greens and fruits and vegetables. So the more that we pair that behavior with something super exciting, the more likely she's gonna wanna do it again. So kind of similar, if we all got ice cream every time we made our bed, we all probably have beds made every single day. So uh, kind of the school of thought there. We use training as an important way, like I've already talked about, to be able to take the best care that we can of all of our animals. So kind of coach them through some of those medical scenarios that we might need to do to make sure that they're nice and healthy, as well as some of their natural exercise. So even just getting coconut out here on the tree and asking her to move around is really important because sloths, while they don't move that much, <laughs> they do sleep about 18 to 20 hours a day they still need to have a little bit of exercise and we're able to provide coconut some of that exercise here at the aquarium by kind of encouraging her to get up and move around on the tree. It's also really important for her mental and physical stimulation. So um, just like we learn new things, we encounter new things in our environment every single day, it's really important that we give our animals the opportunities to also learn and to encounter new and different things every day and training is a really great way that we can kind of offer them that opportunity to problem solve and kind of work through those moments. Do any of you guys have any questions about coconut? I can keep spouting sloth facts all night long, but definitely want to make sure that you guys get any questions answered. So these guys are pretty, like I said, they're pretty well adapted for their environment, hanging out in trees in the rainforest of Central and South America. And their whole mode of life is to conserve as much energy as possible. So they have some pretty crazy adaptations that allow them to do that. So we already talked about their claws and their ability to hang their body upside down, which is actually takes a lot less muscle than it would um, to be able to walk on the top of those branches. 
But the other thing that's really cool about a sloth um, is their digestive system is super, super slow. Their metabolism is really slow, which is part of the reason why they need to conserve so much energy because it takes them a while to make energy. But unlike most mammals, we all uh, run our own metabolism. So we actually use some of our energy stores from the food that we've already broken down to kind of kickstart our body's process to break down more food. These guys don't do that. So they, what they actually do is they rely solely on their gut bacteria to do their digestion for them. So we all have bacteria that lives in our gut and it helps us digest some of our food, but we kind of have to help it along. These guys rely solely on that gut bacteria, so they actually don't need any energy input to get that energy output, but it does take a really long time. It takes her about a month to digest one meal. So the food that I'm feeding her here today will take her an entire 30 days to actually break down and actually eliminate from her body. So it does take quite a long time. The other kind of caveat to um, not running your own digestive system or metabolism is that you actually don't create your own body temperature. So we create our own body heat by our metabolism and kind of um, that energy that we're making. And these guys don't have that benefit. So it's really important that they stay in a very stable environment. Otherwise they can get um, hypothermic pretty quickly. Um, the other bad thing is that gut bacteria has to stay in a pretty stable environment as well. So if their temperature in their natural habitat drops um, below 75 degrees, that gut bacteria is going to start dying off and these guys can actually die of starvation with a full belly of food. So not super great. Um, you know, everything kind of comes with gives and takes. So it doesn't take as much energy to be able to take her energy, but also means that she's got to stay in a pretty stable environment. Now, lucky, luckily for her, that rainforest is going to stay pretty stable. So she doesn't really have to worry about that too much. But as we all know, our world is starting to have some major temperature fluctuations all over. So that can really start to kind of pose a threat to some of our, our wild sloths in their natural range as far as their survival. The other big thing that's really going to impact these guys is actually deforestation. So I know we've kind of been hearing this for years now, but we are using lots and lots of paper goods, like things like toilet paper and paper towels every single day. So it's things that we really can't avoid. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of that comes from our natural rainforests like the Amazon. So one thing that everybody that you guys can all do at home that goes a long way for coconut and her wild friends is actually using recycled paper goods like recycled toilet paper recycled paper towels things like that um, being able to repurpose other paper products that we use into some of those paper products that we can't live without um, can go a long way for them as well you guys have any questions yet if i sparked any interest <laughs> They are completely solitary. So um, pretty much social interaction and activity takes energy, right? Their whole mode of life is what can I do to conserve as much energy as I possibly can? So they actually are very solitary, very independent. They don't even allow another sloth to hang out in their own tree. They're pretty territorial. The only time you're gonna see two sloths together is mom and baby. And usually mom has kind of kicked baby out of the nest at about a year or so, if not earlier. So that's really the only time you're gonna see two sloths unless you are lucky enough to um, kind of see two mating sloths, which doesn't happen very often. Um, they actually don't even put a whole lot of energy into their mating ritual. The female will actually sit in a tree and just scream out, hoping that a male in the nearby area happens to hear her and make his slow way over to her tree. Um, so their um, breeding interval actually doesn't have kind of a natural um, interval like most other animals like a calving interval where you know a dolphin will have a baby every two years and it's pretty you know standard that every two years they're going to have another calf it's not like that at all with slaps it can be very sporadic they can start having babies as young as two years um, but sometimes it can be several years before they'll have another one so yeah great question <laughs> she is a year and a half yeah She's actually probably right over that. I think she's close to close to 17 months now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. So um, somebody from our audience here at the St. Louis University asked um, if these guys move so slowly that they grow algae or moss on their fur. 
So yeah, if you guys see a wild sloth or a sloth in their natural habitat, you'll notice they kind of have a green tent and that's absolutely what that is. So they do grow some algae on their fur and that's mostly because these guys sleep 18 hours a day. So not only do they move really slow, but they don't really move a whole lot at all. So anything that hangs out really still in a really hot, humid environment is probably going to grow some mold and algae on it. That's just kind of how it works. But it's actually really important for coconut or for a sloth um, to have that algae in that natural range because it actually adds an extra layer of camouflage. So if you're trying to hide from your predators in a tree and you're already brown, then you start to grow some green on you, you're going to start to look even more like a tree. So that's actually a pretty good benefit. But even further than that, that algae is actually, um, it invites a little bug called a sloth moth to actually lay eggs and breed in the fur of a sloth. So those little eggs will hatch out, the little larvae will eat all the little algae on her fur, but it also eats a lot of the bacteria that would be on her skin. In that really hot human environment, that's a perfect breeding ground for that bacteria. So those little larval moths will actually help keep her skin nice and healthy as well. So it's a pretty important symbiotic relationship between the two, meaning that both organisms kind of benefit from that relationship. And that moth will actually only lay eggs in the fur of a sloth. So that's also pretty cool. Sloths kind of become their own little micro ecosystems in that way. So pretty awesome way to kind of um, show how connected all of our organisms and our ecosystems are. For you guys that just came up, this is Coconut. She is our one and a half year old two-toed sloth. Now it's pretty funny that she's called a two-toed sloth because if you look at her toes, she actually only has, or she actually has three toes on her back feet. Um, these guys are called the three toe or the two-toed sloth because of their fingers. So on their front feet, they have two toes or two fingers. So that's gonna be the biggest difference between a two-toed and a three-toed sloth is that, um, or at least um, physically, um, that they have that different number of toes on their front feet. Two-toed sloths are a little bit bigger than the three-toed sloths generally as well. So the really crazy thing about the two-toed and the three-toed sloths is they're actually not related at all. So their common ancestor lived millions and millions of years ago. So they didn't evolve together. So it's a pretty kind of cool thing to think about. It's the perfect example of convergent evolution, meaning that two animals evolved or adapted to do the same thing and live in the same environment and look the same way without being genetically related, which is pretty cool. They are both still mammals, but they are not directly genetically related to each other. So pretty, um, pretty cool stuff. Do you guys have any questions about her? So these guys are named. Hi guys. We hope you enjoyed learning about coconut the sloth. If you were wondering why there's so many people who love sloths, now you know it's because they're adorable and such cool animals. Now we're gonna shift gears a little bit and focus a little more on conservation. Right now we are in the Conservation and Education Center. This is a free admission space that's operated by the St. Louis Aquarium Foundation, which is the nonprofit partner to the aquarium. We are just outside of the aquarium here at Union Station. We knew that when people would come visit the aquarium and see all of the amazing animals in there, that they would be interested in finding ways that they can help protect those animals and their habitats. So we started the St. Louis Aquarium Foundation and we have this space here where people can come learn about how their habits impact ecosystems. So you probably noticed that I'm standing around a lot of plastic bottles. Take a look at all of these bottles. How many bottles do you think are in this sculpture? Type your guess into the chat. That way, if you're right, you have proof. How many bottles do you think you're looking at here? So the number of bottles in this sculpture are the same amount of bottles that are purchased in the United States every 1.5 seconds. So you are looking at about 5,000 plastic bottles. So we had an artist design this sculpture and put it here in our conservation and education center so that we could help communicate the severity of the single-use plastic problem to all of our visitors. Single-use plastics are bad for the environment because they're not easily recyclable. Single-use plastics include things like packaging, 
um, water bottles, soda bottles, anything that you use one time and then throw away. So maybe you're wondering why single-use plastics are any worse than a single-use aluminum can or a glass bottle. And it's actually because plastic is not very easily recycled. Every time you recycle plastic, it breaks down to where it's harder to make it into something new and useful. You can only recycle plastic about three times before it's no longer able to be made into something else. Whereas glass or aluminum can be recycled again and again. So we partnered with the St. Uh, the St. Louis Cardinals and we collected plastic bottles from Bush Stadium that were then used to build this pretty impressive sculpture. So it's impressive that it's so large, but we hope that it is meaningful to people and helping them rethink how many plastic bottles they use. Plastic pollution affects all animals, but we're gonna show you one particular type of animal that is highly impacted by pollution. So if you look over here, I have a special guest with us today. And this animal is so sensitive to pollution that I'm actually going to put some gloves on before I handle her. So this type of animal has very porous skin. Humans have skin that allows, uh, that protects us from most mild chemicals, but just like some harsher chemicals can hurt our skin, um, this animal, their skin absorbs the chemicals so well, or anything that touches their skin, that we have to use gloves in order to handle them. So let me get this open here. Do you have any guesses at what this animal might be? Go ahead and type it in the chat. Let's zoom in so we can see her here. This is our friend Mandy. Mandy is a tiger salamander. Can you guys see her? So salamanders are a type of amphibian. There are over 600 species of salamanders in the world, and this is the largest type of land-dwelling salamander in North America. Amphibians are a class of animal that lives part of their life in an aquatic environment using gills to breathe underwater. Then typically in their adult stage, they form lungs that allow them to breathe air and transition to life on land. Salamanders, like most amphibians, have very porous skin, like I mentioned, which means that it easily absorbs things that they come into contact with, like water or chemicals that might be in the soil. While our human skin is somewhat absorbent, it does a pretty good job of protecting us against most of these mild type chemicals. You're probably looking at this beautiful animal and wondering where it might live in the wild. And they are native to North America. They can survive anywhere that is wet enough um, for them to be comfortable. You probably, or maybe you haven't seen one of these in the wild before, and that's because they like to burrow under the dirt. So salamanders like to live uh, beneath the surface of the soil where it's moist and dark. And they do this um, in a way to catch their prey. So they're called ambush predators. That means that they hide under the soil and they wait for an unsuspecting insect to come along and then they quickly snap, uh, grab that insect out of the air to, to enjoy them for a meal. So they have very beautiful yellow and black markings. So you'd think they would be pretty recognizable if you did wild, but it is because they like to live beneath the surface um, that you don't see them too often. So let's zoom in and get you guys a nice close-up look of our tiger salamander, Mandy. So Amphibians, like all animals, are impacted by pollution. Um, but because salamanders have such absorbent skin and they like to live under the soil in wet areas, near like areas near streams, these animals are at risk at being harmed by human pollution. Now, while most people don't personally throw trash or chemicals into a river, it's not the only way that pollution ends up in our waterways. Trash on the ground, whether it's put there by someone littering or blown out of a trash can by the wind will eventually be washed into a waterway by the rain if it's not picked up. When it rains, the rainwater rushes down hills and across parking lots and streets, down your roof and down your driveway, and it brings all that trash and chemicals with it into a storm drain or a nearby stream. Salamanders are not the only animal affected by pollution because every animal on earth needs clean water to survive, including humans. 
We have a few other animals here in the Conservation and Education Center. And we'll show you some of them just behind me. We have a corn snake and we have some Eastern newts as well as a Northern map turtle. And then we specifically wanted to show you our sunfish. So we'll get you a good shot of the sunfish over there. We decided to feature sunfish in the Conservation and Education Center um, because it's related to the research that Dr. Knost is doing on fish species in the Merrimack River. So we include a little bit about Dr. Knost's research on the sign there, and then we have the species there so people can start to think about how their actions are impacting animals locally. There's a lot of really cool animals that live in the ocean that are affected by our habits here, even in the Midwest. But there's also really cool animals locally that need our help protecting their habitat as well. All right, so now what we're gonna do is have a few minutes to answer some questions that you guys might have. We're gonna have Dr. Knoft joining us again. And then our biologist, Brittany, is gonna be coming down um, when she finishes up with coconut as well. So if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box. We will be able to read them live and answer your questions as they come in. So we're gonna move over here. We have Dr. Knopf joining us again. Let's see what kind of questions we have. Uh, so we have the question, how long has the aquarium been in St. Louis? So we actually just opened um, it was Christmas Day, so December 25th of 2019. Um, unfortunately, shortly after opening, we did have to close for a few months, but now we are open again. So there's probably a lot of people who haven't had the chance to visit us in person, so we're really glad you guys could join us for this virtual program. All right, um, a question for Dr. Knopf. How do you see the research in the Water Institute contributing to the mission of the Aquarium Foundation? So um, the Water Institute at St. Louis University is interested in the conservation and sustainability of freshwater systems. And so that can range from the economic implications of uh, quality fresh water, uh, the impacts of human activities on freshwater ecosystems, and the conservation of biodiversity, and just, very generally the sustainability of water. And so what the Aquarium Foundation is doing is really fundamentally important to that because it serves as an avenue for education. And the education is in the communication of science and natural resources really critical to the application of the kind of research that we're doing at St. Louis University. It's an, it's an exciting place at the aquarium. Yes, it is. And we are, we are open to the public right now. Um, so hopefully you will get a chance to visit us in person when you all feel comfortable doing so. But we are open right now and you'll, you might see some uh, guests from the public walking behind the camera too. Um, so another question, Jason, is how do you see the aquarium fitting into activities of the greater St. Louis area? Yeah, St. Saint, uh, Saint Louis is a wonderful scientific community. And in fact, you know, I'm a little bit biased, but I would say it's one of the, one of the most complete scientific uh, communities in the country. So we have world-class universities. We've got the Missouri Botanical Garden, the St. Louis Zoo, um, the Danforth Plant Science Center. I mean, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of PhD scientists in the St. Louis region, all some way or another focused on how to improve the life uh, on our planet. And so the one thing that, that we've been missing is the water component. And it's, it's really so, so fortunate that we have the aquarium and the St. Louis uh, Aquarium Foundation at Union Station because it fills that important role. And I mean, we are, I mean, our area is so unique. We're literally at the confluence of two of the most important rivers in the world, the Missouri and the Mississippi. We also have the Illinois River. So, I mean, it, it just really couldn't be a better place to add sort of this final piece into the um, St. Louis scientific and conservation community. Yeah, I agree. And something I think is really interesting to think about is that the whole reason that St. Louis is here as a city is because of our position on these two 
large rivers. The Mississippi River is the largest river in the United States. And because of our position in that confluence area, um, St. Louis was put on the map. Um, it became a big trade hub. Um, and then once Union Station was here, it was the busiest train station in the world for a time when it was um, first built here. So I think we've become a little bit disconnected from our history, which was tied so in line with the rivers. And having an aquarium here and then our conservation and education center is a great way to help people reconnect with, with rivers and to start making water stewardship an important thing to think about and talk about and practice as well. Yeah. So if you have any questions, if anything comes to you, please feel free to write that in the chat. We will be able to answer any questions about the SLU Water Institute or um, Dr. Knauf's research or anything about conservation or our conservation education center here. Um, we do have some sloth questions. Um, I can look through those and see if I can answer some before our biologist is able to join us. She's probably putting the sloth um, away right now and I'm sure she'll be here soon. Um, a question for Dr. Knopf. Can you tell us more about what studying sunfish and other aquatic species tells us about water and the environment? Sure. So, um, you know, I tend to think of the organisms that live in our rivers and streams and lakes as indicators of what's going on on the landscape. So every time it rains, that rain falls on the landscape and it flows towards our rivers and streams and it picks up everything that we're doing, um, everything about our lifestyles, and it washes them into our rivers and streams. And so the fish, the amphibians, the insects, even the microbes are telling us so much about how we're using the planet. And so what they're really doing for us, you know, beyond providing recreational and economic opportunities, is providing us the opportunity to better understand how we're living with the planet and how we can live in a more sustainable way in the coming decades. Great. So I saw a couple sloth questions that I can answer. Um, one was how long can they hang? And sloths actually spend the majority of their lives up upside down. So the answer to that would be almost all the time. <laughs> they, the only time they're not hanging is when they go to the ground to go to the bathroom because um, they do go to the bathroom only on the ground, not up in the trees. The other question was why we have a sloth at an aquarium. And I will say we do get that question a lot. <laughs> um, but the reason is because we are trying to help people make that connection between how water quality and caring for our planet affects all animals, um, animals that live in the water, and then also animals that drink water like you and me, and like a sloth, like coconut. Um, the sloth does not have a permanent exhibit here. Um, well, I shouldn't say that. It is permanent, but it's not out on the floor. Um, so the sloth does live behind the scenes, and then we are able to bring her out to do personalized um, presentations about her and, and do some live Q&A sessions with her here as well. We do have two sloths that live here, Coconut, who you just met, and then we have another um, adult sloth named Chewy. Um, Brittany has just joined us, our biologist who was teaching you all about coconut before. Um, so Brittany, we do have some sloth questions ready for you, but I'll give you a chance to get <laughs> situated first. Thanks for joining us. Oh, of course. Um, so Brittany, yes. um, one of the questions we have here is, how, um, how long do sloths live and what are their natural predators? Yeah, so they can live um, average of about 20 to 30 years in their natural range, sometimes a little less, you know, as young ones and things like that get picked off by predators. Um, some of their main predators um, in the trees, when they're hanging out in the trees, are going to be jaguars, ocelots, and the harpy eagle. If you guys have never seen a harpy eagle, definitely Google search it. They're a pretty impressively large bird. So that's gonna be some of their main predators when they're actually up in the tree. And believe it or not, one of their other main predators are actually large anacondas. So if they're ever swimming, trying to get to another tree, or when it, they do have some of those floods that you know, are not uncommon to the Amazon, um, that can be something that they fall prey to. So. Yeah, <laughs> great, thank you. Um, Brittany, maybe you can help me with this one too. We had a question of what is the difference between a newt and a salamander? That's that a one great, kind of sounds to me a little bit. Question. I know that the newts that we have here are much smaller than, than the tiger salamander um, and they live in the water for a long portion of their life. And I right. think salamanders live in the water for a smaller portion of their life. 
Do you yeah. have anything? That, that's okay. pretty much how I've understood it. I'm definitely, unfortunately, not an amphibian um, expert by any means. So, mm -hmm. but that's definitely how I understood it. They spend, they kind of come out of the water, the newts do, and then kind of spend a lot of their adult life still in the water, where most salamander species will actually fully emerge from the water, but still live by water. There are some fully aquatic salamanders, though, so exceptions to all rules, but that's kind of the biggest differences that I understood Great. as well. Thank you, Brittany. Um, let's see. Um, Dr. Knopft, how does river life support the greater ecosystems? So it's a, that's a really good question. And, I, and so I'll come back to what you mentioned, Amelia, about why a sloth might be at an aquarium. And so, you know, we look at the rivers and streams and lakes and the water doesn't begin and end in the river. So the water in our rivers and, and streams and so forth is just really we're seeing one part of the global hydrologic cycle. And so water is constantly cycling from our rivers to the ocean, to the atmosphere, raining down into our forests. And so by maintaining these, these quality or high quality hydrologic systems and hydrologic cycles, what we're doing is providing water to the entire global ecosystem at a rate that allows uh, the sustenance of, of every ecosystem on the planet. So, a sloth, for example, is wholly dependent on the hydrologic cycle over the Amazon basin because it's how much rain is falling. And all that rain then supports the healthy forests of the Amazon. And that supports the, the sloths. And then, you know, that water rushes out to the Amazon. And the Amazon then filters all that water. And it rushes out to the ocean. And that's like the nutrients coming from the Amazon support all the productivity in the ocean and then you have evaporation and it comes back over to the Amazon, for example. So it's really important to think about not only what we're directly doing to the rivers, but also what we're doing to the landscape, whether it be, you know, cutting down forests or, or you know, affecting the landscape in the way that it alters the, the way water moves through the hydrologic cycle. So literally every part of our planet is dependent on our water, you know, our water systems basically working the way they should and working in a natural way. And if we start, you know, tweaking these systems and we keep pushing them and pushing them and pushing them, eventually we're gonna see sort of these cascading effects on the rest of the global ecosystem. Yeah, we're all connected. And that's um, a big part of what we try to communicate to people who visit the Conservation and Education Center. Um, another question that we had was about um, plastic being found in fish. And I, I should have mentioned this before when we talked about the plastic bottle sculpture, but another reason that single use plastics are so harmful to the environment is because when they do end up as litter, so when they are just out in the natural world, they don't decompose, they don't fully break down. They just break down into smaller and smaller pieces of plastic. And as they do that, they slowly release toxins into the environment. You might have heard um, people talk about microplastics, and that's just what this is. It's when plastic breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces, and then it's really hard to clean up once it's that small. So it often gets, it's usually already in the water at that point, and fish might mistake it for food or they might accidentally ingest it. And what's happening is fish are ending up with these small pieces of plastic inside their bodies. We're finding them in plastic when people are in fish, when people are going fishing, um, or when people buy fish um, to eat, you can sometimes find plastic inside their bodies. And because of that, and because of the fact that humans eat fish sometimes, um, plastic is even being found in human bodies now. So the amount of plastic that's in the environment is just, it's an incredible amount already. So we do try to tell people um, the severity of the single use plastic problem and hope that people will think twice before they buy another a disposable bottle and try to use some reusable options instead. We have time for a few more questions, so it's not too late to type it in the chat if you have anything you'd like to ask. Um, we do have another question for um, Dr. Knopft. Why does your display focus on, sun, on sunfish instead of some other type of fish in uh, the Merrimack River? That is, that was one of my hardest choices of the past couple of years is when, when they graciously asked if, uh, at the Aquarium Foundation if I would put or contribute some sort of fish. So there are over a hundred species of fish in the Merrimack and every single one of them is wonderful. So, um, 
and interestingly, as a side note, we have the Merrimack itself is a center of biodiversity in North America. We have more species of minnows in the Merrimack than any other place in North America. So it's really, I mean, it's not just this one sunfish, but the thing that, the reason that we have the sunfish here, and I think that it's really important, and coming back to the idea of bioindicators and what the fish can tell us about how we're using the environment. There's one part of the Merrimack, uh, the Big River, which historically, um, there was a lot of lead mining uh, in the in the big river watershed and in fact uh, more lead was taken out of that area uh, during the 20th century i believe than anywhere else in the world and so subsequently there's a lot of lead contamination in the area and what we found with some of our research is that in those sections of the big river where we have lead contamination there are 50 percent fewer of fish like the long-eared sunfish than we think that there should be. And so the long-eared sunfish, it's a beautiful fish. And if you go fishing, you've probably caught a long-eared sunfish, but it's also closely related to things like smallmouth bass and largemouth bass. And so if we look at long-eared sunfish, we can sort of infer what might be happening to similar species like the bass. And of course, um, you know, if an anybody likes fishing, um, you probably have fished for bass at some point. So what the long-eared sunfish has done is it give, it's given us some insight into how that historical lead mining within the watershed uh, is impacting the ecosystem. And there's a huge, huge amount of effort right now to remediate um, the impacts of that lead mining, which is great. And so what, what we're hoping we can do in just one small way is contribute to sort of that baseline understanding and how we can move forward with remediation of the watershed. Great. Okay, this question is for Brittany. Um, what is your favorite animal to work with and why? I, I, I hate this question because it's so hard to pick a favorite. Um, I've had um, the honor of working with lots of different species throughout my career. Um, and we have lots of different species here at the aquarium that I get to work with every day. Um, coconut has been a really big joy for me. She's my first sloth that I've ever worked with and she's a young sloth. So not only am I partially responsible for kind of helping her learn and develop at the rate that a sloth is supposed to, um, but it's also taught me a lot because she's, sloths are very different than most other mammals in terms of their motivation and their modes of life and how they live and all that stuff. So it's been really challenging for me as an animal behaviorist to work with an animal that is so behaviorally different than a lot of other mammals. So um, I definitely super enjoy working with coconut, but um, you know, I hate to, to claim her as my favorite because I've had just as much um, joy working with a lot of the other species that I've worked with throughout my career as well. But she's definitely a pretty big uh, plus for my job here at the aquarium for sure. <laughs> Great. Um, okay. Oh, and another question, Brittany, was um, if someone wanted to come to the aquarium and see coconut, when would be a good time for them to do that? So the best time to plan is early in the morning. Um, 9.30 every day is when we plan to get her out. Um, we try to have either her or Chewy out at 2 p.m. And then on a later night, um, kind of depending on what's going on um, with our staffing and things, you might see her later in the evening as well. But if you're really wanting to meet coconut, I would definitely plan on trying to get here at 930. Um, with all of our animal ambassadors, though, coconut included, um, they all have a positive choice and control and what happens in their environment. So what that means is as her trainers, we have given her the opportunities through her training to be able to say no to not wanting to come out for encounter or um, really to do any of the behaviors that we ask. So she certainly could say that she just wants to continue her 18 to 20 hours of beauty rest that she gets every day uh, and not feel like coming out. So unfortunately, we can never guarantee that you will get to see coconut, um, but we do um, have pretty good success. She, you know, she is definitely um, still enjoying coming out to say hi to all of our guests and stuff. So 930 is probably your best bet if you want to see her. Yeah, great. Thanks, Brittany. All right. Um, Dr. Knopf, this question's for you. Um, we have about two minutes left, um, and I think you might use every bit of that to answer this question. Um, so we heard in the news um, what happened in Flint, Michigan with the water quality up there and the high lead levels. Are there any plans with the SLU Water Institute to do water testing in St. Louis? We, so the, the Water Institute has, has just started in the past few months. And one of the things we have discussed is becoming a resource for that type of testing in the St. Louis region. Because 
you know, the, you know, we talk about the Merrimack as a large area and um, most of it is forested and rural, but our water quality issues are also extended into the city, right? And so it's not necessarily the Merrimack we're dealing with, but all the watersheds um, that flow towards St. Louis. And we've done a fair amount of work in, in my lab um, trying to understand how chloride, like basically rock salt is getting into our streams and the impact that that's having in our streams. And what we've done is partnered with various communities in St. Louis City um, to investigate this issue and really move more towards this idea of community science. And part of that at the Water Institute, I think we hope, is engaging the community to help them better understand their water resources. So those types of issues with testing might be something that we'll be doing. Great. Well, thank you all for joining us. And thank you, Brittany, for rushing down here after <laughs> you were finished upstairs. Um, Dr. Knopf, did you have any closing remarks that you'd like to give? Yeah, I'd just like to thank everyone for joining us at the virtual night at the aquarium. And I want to thank uh, Amelia and Brittany, everyone at the St. Louis Aquarium Foundation. And if you haven't been to the aquarium, get here. It is truly <laughs> one of the jewels of the St. Louis region. And I personally couldn't be happier right now that they're here. Thanks a lot. See you later.